Natalie. <laughs> so we want to talk about how to integrate the economy, society, and the rest of nature to create the future we want. I think that's our challenge. How do we create? Sorry? Louder. Okay, we're, I'm in the wrong place. Um, <clears throat> so if I go louder, that's what happens. Just keep talking, don't adjust the louder. Okay. So, so. <laughs> if you're not talking, you can adjust it. Okay, I have to keep talking. Are you adjusting? <clears throat> we live in a whole new geologic epic called the Anthropocene because of the magnitude of the human influence on the, on the surrounding biosphere. You've probably all heard this term before. I think the bottom line is that we have to start thinking very differently about the place of humans in the biosphere. You know, business as usual is no longer an option. Uh, we have to create a new vision um, of the world and humans' place in it. Um, otherwise, I think we, we, um, we have the, the very real possibility of our civilization collapsing. So I think this is the real question that we're facing. Can humanity make the transition to a sustainable and desirable future uh, without a major collapse? Certainly in the past, civilizations have collapsed. The Roman Empire, the Maya, uh, Easter Island. So this is not a new thing. Um, how, do we, how do we make this transition? <clears throat> and I think that's, that's our challenge going forward. Uh, to, to get to this sustainable <laughs> and desirable level of the microphones. Um, <laughs> this is a balancing thing. Um, requires these three elements, I think, that have to be integrated. We have to have a vision not only of how the world is, how the world works. So we talked a little bit about uh, all of the new science that we have, about how complex systems function, um, what uh, the science of happiness, what actually contributes to human well-being. Uh, but also, how would we like it to be? What's our, what are our goals? What's our vision for the future? I think really that's, that's our fundamental challenge here in this workshop. How do we create a shared vision of the kind of world that we want? Uh, because the, the direction that we're headed is neither sustainable nor desirable. <clears throat> we have to uh, integrate that with appropriate tools and analysis, systems thinking and modeling, thinking of the holistic uh, components of the system and implementation strategies that really focus uh, going forward on building institutions around, around the commons. That's kind of the missing element going forward. Um, vision is really important. It's a famous American philosopher, Yogi Berra, once said, if you don't know where you're going, you end up somewhere else. Uh, so how do we create this shared vision of where it is we want to go so that we don't where, end up somewhere else? Part of that, vi part of that vision, <laughs> is um, recognizing, I think as Kate pointed out, uh, that the economy is really embedded in society, which is embedded in the rest of nature. It's a very different vision uh, from, I think, the conventional view uh, in the empty world, where the economy, the environment, and society were all separate things with a bit of interaction, uh, but not really uh, integrated. And the idea that, do I have a pointer here? Yes. The idea that you know nature was the environment, when in fact, I think nature is the whole system. Um, you know, humans are not unnatural. Uh, our societies are not unnatural. So how do we understand the way societies function, uh, the way the economy functions, the way the rest of nature functions as one integrated whole system? That really is what ecological economics is all about. And we know that um, because of this emerging science that the, the world is really a complex, nonlinear, adaptive system uh, we've got thresholds and tipping points and surprises. Um, this is from a paper by Tim Lenton and others <clears throat> uh, about some of the potential tipping points in the climate system. Um, <clears throat> so, just to, to run, can I get a glass of water? Um, and we've talked about um, planetary boundaries that Kate, that Kate brought up. Uh, we know that there are fundamental ecological constraints uh, to the growth of the economic subsystem uh, within the ecological uh, life support system. And there were uh, nine of these uh, planetary boundaries, three of which were already uh, massively exceeding. And we need to get back uh, under control. Climate change, biodiversity loss, and, um, and the, the nitrogen cycle. But several others are also approaching uh, their, their boundaries. <clears throat> now that's the standard way. <laughs> Thank you. 
That's the standard way of approaching this, this issue, though. You know, we're exceeding our boundaries. We've got to get back under, under control. It's not the movie that most people are lining up to go see. Uh, they'd rather see a reassuring lie than this inconvenient truth. Uh, the point is, I think we need a third movie. Uh, we need a movie that really expresses what a sustainable and desirable economy in society, in nature, uh, really could look like. It's not a sacrifice to create this, this new system. It's really a sacrifice not to. Uh, and I think that's the message that we have to somehow convey uh, more appropriately to the, uh, to the general public, to the policy community, uh, to all of us. Um, this is just a, uh, a report that we did for the UN Rio Plus 20 meeting uh, with some, uh, some co-authors that you might recognize uh, that, that goes into more detail about uh, what that society could look like, what's the vision of it, and also a whole uh, range of policy options about, about how to get there. So if you want more details, you can download this uh, for free. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's really what ecological economics is trying to do. <sighs> Thank you. To create this sustainable and desirable future. It has three sort of integrated questions or goals. How do we create a system uh, that is ecologically sustainable? The scale, the magnitude of the economic subsystem remains within planetary boundaries. Uh, that has a socially fair distribution of resources, not only within the current generation of humans, but also between the current generation and future generations, between humans and other species. So this whole idea of fairness, it's really fairness that we want, not so much equity. We don't want everything to be exactly equal, <clears throat> but we do want it to be uh, fair, fair opportunities, uh, et cetera. Um, and we want an economically efficient allocation of resources, <clears throat> and that includes um, all the resources that contribute to human well-being, not just marketed resources, but all of the things that are outside uh, the market, natural capital and social capital. Um, so the, the SDGs have already been mentioned, and I think this is a significant step um, in human history toward creating this shared vision. You know, this is the kind of world. We want a world where all of these goals uh, really have been met. Um, and they're a very diverse set of goals. There's only one, really, that has to do with, with economic growth. Um, and, I'll, and we'll get, get more into that, but I think we should be more, as Kate said, agnostic about growth. Uh, we really want a, an economy that c contributes to well-being. What the SDGs didn't do, really, is talk too much about how the, all of these goals interact with each other. Uh, there are synergies, there are trade-offs, um, there's a complex set of interactions uh, that, that contribute to these sub-goals that are the sort of ecological economics framework of sustainable scale, fair distribution, and efficient allocation, and ultimately to the overarching goal of a prosperous, high quality of life that's equitably shared and sustainable. I think that's the kind of world we, we all want. <clears throat> how do we understand uh, this complex set of interactions and how they contribute to that, to that overarching goal. Um, this is a bit of a complex um, diagram, <laughs> and I won't go into all the details here, but you're going to have these slides, so you can, you can uh, study this later. But it, it tries to make the distinction between our current economic model, the sort of neoliberal model that, that uh, Kate was talking about, uh, the sort of green economy model, which you might have heard of. I think it's kind of a, a step in the right direction, but it's not all the way there uh, to the ecological economics model. Um, these vary in terms of their primary policy growth goal. You know, the current model is more economic growth is kind of the solution to all problems. Uh, the green economy model recognizes that it has some negative impacts on the environment. And we need to decouple uh, the, the economy from, uh, from the environment, and then we can continue to grow. Uh, the ecological economics model focuses on better. You know, we want true development, improvement in quality rather than than incre increasing size, because we recognize there are fundamental uh, biophysical limits uh, to economic growth. How do we measure progress, GDP, uh, versus other um, broader indices that, that Ida will talk about? You're kidding me. Five minutes? <laughs> OK. Um, scale, distribution, uh, efficiency. Also, property rights, I think, are, are uh, treated uh, quite differently. Uh, the role of government, you know, government has a fundamental role to play, I think, in the ecological economics approach, and, and the principles of government. We need to move away from laissez-faire capitalism uh, to a set of sustainable uh, governance principles. Whoa, I'll never get through this in five minutes. <laughs> 
You're kidding. Wait a minute. <laughs> How about all that time getting the, the, uh, the level of the microphone correct? <laughs> Okay, so the conventional model looks something like this. You can see that there's nothing in this picture of the, mo of the, uh, the economy that would limit uh, the growth of GDP you know, uh, uh, indefinitely. Uh, land, labor, and capital, the primary factors are considered to be substitutable with each other. We don't really need land or natural resources. Uh, we can just produce more GDP by, by creating more labor and capital and that um, utility or welfare is a function of consumption. The more we consume, the better off we are, growth can go on forever, uh, et cetera. Uh, obviously, not the right picture in the full world. Uh, we need to recognize that we live in a materially closed system, uh, that these four types of capital assets are all required uh, in a more balanced way to produce conventional economic uh, pr production, but also directly contribute to human well-being, <coughs> which is a much more complex function, then, then the more we consume, the better off we are. Uh, you know, our, the contribution of natural capital, ecosystem services, social capital, our community, etc. All of those things are very important to, to sustaining uh, human well-being. <clears throat> okay. And a, a big part of that is the contribution of natural capital. Uh, there's a whole range of services that, uh, or that uh, benefits that human derive from functioning ecosystems without having to pay for them. Uh, so that we have the, the GDP, but we also have the free DP, all of the other things that, that are uh, freely provided. Um, what this diagram misses, misses, though, is the interaction with other forms of capital. Uh, so we need all of these types of capital assets in a more balanced way, interacting together to produce sustainable human well-being. And I think that's part of the challenge. How do we understand that interaction? It's inherently a transdisciplinary uh, study uh, that, that is required to do that. Um, we, um, 20 years ago now, uh, we estimated the total value of the ecosystem services on the, on the planet and came up with a number that was significantly larger than, than GDP at the time. Um, <clears throat> one thing we didn't control was what they put on the cover of the, the magazine. They said pricing the planet. We didn't really mean that. We meant valuing the planet. And the, the distinction between price and value, I think, is something that, that, uh, that we need to keep in mind. These are not resources that can or should be traded in markets, but contribute to well-being outside the market. You know, they're part of the, the free DP. Uh, recently, we estimated the change in value from um, 1997 until 2011. And because of land use change and the way we manage resources, we've lost about $20 trillion in the value of ecosystem services over that, per year uh, over that time period. <clears throat> so by ignoring our natural capital assets, and our social capital assets as well. Uh, we're really reducing our well-being. <clears throat> we estimated the benefit-cost ratio, uh, roughly, of preserving our natural capital assets by increasing our, uh, the global reserve network and, um, <clears throat> to 15% of the terrestrial biosphere, 30% of the marine biosphere. That would cost about $45 billion a year to build and maintain. But the net benefits, the difference between the current, the, the, the wild state of that, that system and what it might be converted to is four to five trillion dollars a year. So benefit cost ratio of about 100 to one. So I, I challenge you to come up with a better investment uh, these days. The only one I could find was for oil companies investing in political campaigns in the United States, <laughs> which is about 400 to one, unfortunately. So, um, and I'll finish up quickly here. <laughs> Because I think this is an important part, too. Um, how do we actually get there? How do we create this sustainable and desirable economy in society and nature? And I think has to, that has to do <laughs> with breaking our addiction to this growth, all, growth at all costs economic paradigm, to fossil fuels, to overconsumption, and thinking of it really as an addiction. Um, <clears throat> and, and the way out of that addiction, as I'll, I'll say in a second, is to build a shared vision of this sustainable and desirable future focused on well-being and quality of life, the quality of all life. So we, we published a paper recently uh, where we asked, OK, if this is a, an addiction, uh, what can we learn from what works to overcome addictions at the individual scale? <clears throat> and it turns out that there's, there's one form of therapy called motivational interviewing. Some of you may have heard of that. Uh, that focuses on um, not confronting the addict with all of the problems of their addiction, which will immediately get a denial uh, you know, kind of reaction. 
exactly the kind of reaction we're getting from society when we frame the issue you know, in, a, in a very negative way. Um, and instead focuses on um, what sort of um, uh, what sort of future life you know what are the the, uh, the life goals of the addict how does how does that uh, how to, to focus the conversation on that and then work back from from that to say what would really work uh, what would what would help to achieve those goals so the analogy that we draw is uh, to focus societal attention on you know our life goals what does the future that we want really look like. Um, this is one book we published recently that's a collection of essays uh, about just that. What does this future look like? Um, there's also been a lot of work on scenario planning, <clears throat> um, looking at alternative futures and what would they look like. You may have run across the Great Transition Initiative and some of the scenarios that they've been, they've been uh, uh, describing. And they, uh, they have these four basic scenarios uh, that are arrayed against whether we focus on individualism or the community. Uh, and whether we focus on uh, GDP growth uh, or, or well-being. And uh, so you get <clears throat> this, this group of four. It seems like in the United States we seem to be headed more in this direction at the moment. Uh, but there are several other countries around the world that, that are headed in other directions. And, uh, and certainly the kind of world that I think we want is, is focused more over here, where we're focusing on community and overall well-being rather than continuing to focus on GDP growth with all of its problems, which Ida's going to get into in a second. <clears throat> um, and we actually uh, need, I think, to extend uh, that discussion of the kind of future we want out to the general public. Uh, how do we create a set of plausible alternative futures? Um, they did this in New Zealand and found that when they asked people you know, where, what future they wanted, uh, they got to the sort of sustainability future, but they asked them, you know, where they, uh, where they thought uh, New Zealand was and where it was headed, and it was very much more in the, the sort of business as usual uh, uh, scenario. Um, we're working now doing a set of uh, a public opinion survey uh, in Australia of these four alternative uh, scenarios, um, <clears throat> roughly in the same uh, archetypes. And uh, the community well-being scenario is the one that is, is uh, broadly preferred by the vast majority of the population. When you ask them to think about, you know, what kind of world do you want in the year 2050? Um, so I think we could do a lot more with that sort of process. If we as a group here can begin to define uh, not only what, what that kind of world that we want looks like, but what the alternatives are and get people to start thinking about, <clears throat> um, you know, uh, what, what kind of world we all want and use that as the beginning of the societal therapy that I think will help us to break out of this addiction to growth at all costs. All right, thanks for my part. I'm gonna turn it over to you.